Okay, let's get our Bibles out. If you don't have one, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. We are in Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Have you uh, guys been getting ministered to through this series in Psalms? Yeah. Good. Good, good. Yeah, this, I've always like, you know, like I said, I've always loved the thing about the Psalms is just the fact that it's so natural. Uh, you know, as I said, there's 66 books, pretty much 65 God speaking to humanity. But in this one, we have much of it where humanity is speaking out to God, crying out, expressing thoughts and feelings. And it's very important. So let's get into the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bring us here now. I really pray that you will just do something supernaturally miraculous and just clear the room, clear the mechanism. Let us truly have that merry moment. I know I pray that a lot, but I just, there's so many amazing things in this Psalm here that we're gonna look at today. And so could we just please just sit there and see you and hear you and ask that we wouldn't just be informed, that we wouldn't look for our mind just to be scratched, but Lord, that you would do a transforming in us I pray there would be a resonating residue of what we learned last week. And so God, help us to grow in this land in grace, in your time. So I know for that to happen, I and all of us have to get out of the way. So may we decrease and you increase in us. Let the words now of my heart, the meditations, be right in your sight. My God, gifter, salvation, friend, maker, teach us. Your kids are listening. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I'm not necessarily going to ask for a show of hands and response, but did you have any kind of cognitive difference this week by what we learned last week? And truly recognizing what that means to truly believe what God says about us. That is why I believe so many folks are struggling in their walk. And like I said, why worship is kind of an event. It's kind of a thing. And yet we're always saying worship is a lifestyle. And I believe, again, it's because we do not listen to what God says, how he defines us and he describes us, what happened on the cross and what happens when we ask for forgiveness. And I said, we are often listening to the voice of the accuser. And it's so much so that it sounds to us like David is being arrogant when he claims his righteousness and his goodness and, 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 and his integrity. But what we don't get that David it did is all of that is real and true but it was gifted to him by God and he believed it and that's why he was a worshiper let me show you that that's not just an old testament it is through the bible look overhead if you would just let me read for you colossians in colossians 1 19 and see if you can grab the last week's message as it just flows in this whole context it says this for God in all his fullness was what pleased to live in Christ. So there again, God in a bod. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil, what? thoughts and actions. Verse 22, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body, him dying on that cross, paying for our sins. As a result, he has brought you into where? His own presence. Now continue to listen to the Psalms last week, today, and further about this being in God's presence and what that does. He, as a result, he's brought you into his presence and you are and what? Okay, so get it, believe it, quit messing with it. It's the truth. You are holy and blameless if you have responded to what God has done on the cross for you. You have asked him to forgive you and to be your savior. Boom, shakalaka, there it is. And he says it. All right, you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That gets rid of your yes, but. I hear you, pastor, but. No, 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 without a single fault. What? 
Verse 23, but you must continue to believe, believe this truth. But you must continue to believe this truth. You hear it in church, you nod your head, and before you get home, you've believed once again a message that you are not as valuable, that you are worthless, you're not as consistent, blah, 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 blah. And as I said, we've bought into this lie of somehow pseudo-humility, and that's not humility to say, oh, I'm just blessed that he would spend a moment of his time with me. <laughs> you are God's kid. He loves you and wants every hour to be with you. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the... The what? What's that magic word? assurance you received when you heard the good news the good news has been preached all over the world and I Paul and I want you to put your name I wax or I whatever your name have been appointed as God's servant to what proclaim, proclaim it hey tomorrow when someone says hey how you doing you go blown away I'm forgiven <laughs> let's just see what they do let's see their faces Blown away there for the cross. Jesus died for me. Wow. Unbelievable. How you doing? <laughs> Holy and blameless. <laughs> Say what? It's so crazy. We see understanding who God is and what he did for us. That's why we just go, how can I be holy and blameless? Oh my gosh. Chee-hoo. And that's why worship, because worship is a response. Now we are going to be this weekend in Psalm 27. Before we even get into it, as you look at your Bible there, there's these headings often in them. And I want to show you what the heading says in my Bible. And one of the reasons I just go, yeah, a Psalm of what? Fearless trust in God. Here's the point. Fearless trust in God. So he's even fearless, but he's not, there's no fear about his even trusting God. Like, oh, if you, I hope I'm found worthy or found able. He has this fearless trust in God. Doesn't mean he is a person does not have fears or experience those. And that we will see as we go into our passage. So here we go. Psalm, oh, my little tag came off. Psalm 27. There it is. And now I'm going to read it through. I'm reading from a New American Standard. So here we go. It says this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers come upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be what? confident one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple for in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle in the secret place of his tent he will hide me he will lift me up upon what a rock. Think about your New Testament. And now my bed will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I, excuse me, my head, not my bed. My, my print, maybe I'm a little too tired, huh? Okay, here we go. And lifted above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Here, now, Hear how it's going like this. Yes, God, you've done this, all these wonderful things. Then all of a sudden, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. When you did say, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation, for... My father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in a level path. Because of my foes, do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such breathe out violence. I would have despaired 
unless I had what? Believed. believed. What's the other word for believed in a past tense? Starts with an A. Assurance. <laughs> unless I had assurance, unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Did you, did you see verse 13? I could have given up, despaired. I could have just, all, it was so much, so more than me. But he says, something held me. Verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Wow. Something there, huh? Absolutely amazing on what he is saying and he's promising. Now, this is an extremely very powerful, powerful psalm. Did you not, as I was reading it, recognize like a gazillion songs that you've sung in your Christian life? <laughs> him after him, you know, the Lord is my light. And on and on and on, songs and worship songs. Out of this little one, they borrowed from this psalm because of what it says and how it's saying it. And so it's critical that if we can get this last week, hey, worship seems to be so weak. Why? Because we don't believe what God says about us. And when we do, we can be nothing but blown away. Now let's look at what that looks like in this very powerful description that God is doing for us. So let's go verse one and let's dive in and pray that I can get through this in at least an hour and a half to two. Okay, here we go. First one, verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense, some of you, the strength of my life. Whom shall I dread? Whom shall I be afraid? So, shall we close in prayer? I mean, boom. Right there, that's, drop the mic. There, there it is. I mean, first of all, what more does anyone need? That's the thing. What more would anyone absolutely need? I mean, we know that we need light. If we don't, we're just stumbling all over the place. So we know that we need light. And of course, we know that we need salvation. But we also know that we need protection. We need a defender. But I want you to look at this, how the three different versions take this Hebrew word and translate it. As we see in the New American Standard that we need this protection that the Lord is my defender. But now the New King James, the Lord is the strength of my life, which most of us learned in the song. That was the version that was used. And then the Lord is the stronghold. So think about it. It's a defense, the strength, the stronghold. All I'm trying to say is that the scripture is saying something pretty massive that God is and we're not. It's like, man, you got this, God. That's one of my favorite t-shirts. It just says, I got this, God. And I get so many comments from that. When I'm around the people, hey, I like your shirt. Because it's just reminding us the huge, but God. And you see, this is what David is saying. But before we get out of verse one, it's very important. Be with me. Watch this. First, we need to see the use of the personal pronoun. How many times have I said, not just God, but my God? Well, it says the Lord is what? My light. Circle that. He's my light and my salvation. Everything that I'm talking about here, the stoke that is in my life as I speak, it's, you're not going to have it if he's not the one that lights your path. You know later in Psalm 19 that he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And so he's recognizing that God, you are my light. And then of course you are my salvation. But the next thing I want you to notice is this. What comes first? The light. the light. Why? Because we need the light in order to see our own darkness. See, a lot of your friends are just like, I don't get this. I don't know why you need this. I'm glad that works for you. Reason being is they don't even yet have enough light, enough illumination to even see the darkness they're in. And so again, I'm asking you to understand grace. Those that you're around, it gives you just that little bit more grace. I want to hear us more instead of going, oh, those people go, oh, putting. Because <laughs> they don't even have enough light to know they're in the dark. Amen. And so here's that, he, that he's really getting clear. Someone once said a while ago, and I love this, I had it written down in my Bible. Salvation finds us in the dark, but it does not leave us there. It gives light to those who sit in the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. It finds us in the dark, but it doesn't leave us there. Also, very important that you jot down if you're taking notes. It says the Lord is light, not that the Lord gives light. 
Very important. He in of himself is the source of light. People are like, I, I'm looking for some illumination. Hello. It's God. The Lord is light. He doesn't just merely give light. God is our joy. He's our comfort. He's our guide. And he is our light. Hear me now. Within our light around. And he is the light reflected from us. Do you remember the whole moon illustration that I've given to us many times? The moon has no light at all. It's only what? It's only reflecting the... Now, you play with the spelling. And then I wonder, how many of us are a full moon? Or we're just a little crescent? Because we haven't positioned ourselves fully in front of the light. The Lord, Yahweh, he is light. He is salvation. And then that just brings him to, I love how the sentence ends. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I dread? You know, and there's that trendy phrase, right? I mean, whom shall I fear? I mean, that is a great question when you realize what David just proclaimed about who God is. And you see, the thing is, whom shall I fear? Whom sh that question is referring to two things here. Referring to both the present and the future. Speaking about here and now, as well as in eternity. Whom shall I fear? I don't have to fear death. And some of you, hello, you don't have to fear life. You can get up and go out. You can be free. So we can join Paul when he says, if God is for us, what's that last part? <laughs> Who can be against us? But again, do you know it? Okay, yeah, maybe you know it. But do you believe it? Do you reflect that? Are you crescent on this subject or are you full moon on this? If God's for me, who can be against me? This is what God says about what his forgiveness means and what it looks like in my life. Not that I walk in perfection. No, 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 no. The whole point of understanding what God does in and of us when we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So then now the question then is, how could David be so confident? How could it be, you know, the Lord is my life. Whom shall I fear? Who, whom, whom shall I dread? How could he be so confident? Answer, remembered past faithfulness. Just let that sink in for you. Has God been good to you? Do you even have a place that you jot that down, whether it be a journal or like Cindy and I, that little blessing jar and you write it down just past faithfulness. That's how David would list over and over and over. He can truly go at it for tomorrow because he's seen what God did yesterday. I have a motto that I have lived my life on and it has simply been this. Whenever I come across something that I don't know, I fall back on what I do know. Very important. But, but what do I know? Well, I know that God is good, that God is loving and kind. I know that God is large and in charge. So even though I don't have an answer to many of these other things, my trust, my assurance is in what I do know. Amen? Amen. Super important. And then he says this in verse 3. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. And then it says, the war rise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. Okay, confident. And do you remember last week I talked about confidence is very different than arrogance. And that's where sometimes it gets missed by a lot of Christians. And so understanding, he says, man, there is war. Enemies are coming at me and they're, they're, they're threatening war that they want to take me out. But you know what? What they say isn't rocking my world because I have confidence, but my confidence is in the only thing in this world that's stable, and that is God. That is so important if you and I can grasp this. You see, what David is saying to you and I in this verse is that it's not the size of the army. It's not the size of the problem. It's not even the size of the uncertainty that I have right now, what 2022 will be like in 2023. I look at the size of my God, and that is where I have confidence. We serve a big, big God. And again, allow me the graciousness to say to us, does that 
Is that evident to those who look at us? That our God is a big God. That he's got this. Or are our responses to how are you doing or this or that or at work when all of a sudden this is going to happen and I don't know whether we're going to have the budget to make it all the way through. How impacted are we by present information? How much have we yet believed that we have an assurance that regardless of what it looks like, man, there is a mountain on the left, there is a mountain on the right, there is an ocean behind me and there's Egyptians in front of me. Looks like I am done for it. What we saw as a barrier, God saw as a way. Amen? See, that's past faithfulness. Those are the kind of things that I hold on to all the time. But then after he says, listen, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be rocked by all these other things. Why does he say I'm confident? Man, verse 4, we could spend months. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Now, how could you even read this if you are a Christian from at least to the 80s and not be singing that line? <laughs> One thing have I, you know, think about it, it's all in there. Zyra, Lord, that I will seek after. Mm, mm, mm. Here's the situation. First thing it says, in the last part, it says, to behold the beauty of the Lord and meditate in his temple. Well, if you are biblically aware, the temple's not built yet. Who builds the temple? That's Solomon. Okay, so David doesn't build it. So people are like, oh, is it you know, wrong? Or there's another error or proof that somebody else wrote that? No, because we're translating the word. But the word itself that David uses is hekal. Basically for us, it would be H-E-K-A-L with that little line that goes over the K, but hekal. It means literally a magnificent structure. David is around. There are all the pagan, the pagan god Dagon and all these temples and all these things that are around him. I believe this is even part of the, the yearning that he has to eventually want to build a house temple for the Lord. And so what he's saying is, man, I can't wait just to be in your magnificent presence in that magnificent place and to be with you. But the main point we look at here is verse one, in the, I mean, verse four, the first part. One thing I have asked, some of the versions say desired. And you know what David says? He says, it's not material riches. It's not that I would have some kind of impressive ministry. No, no, no. This is simply the one thing he asked is what? That I might behold, what does it say? Come on, help me out. The beauty of the Lord. That I might behold the beauty of the Lord. Now, this is David, king. Pretty much if he said, hey, I want a bologna sandwich, it was there in a moment. One thing I desire, to behold the beauty of the Lord. I guess we start with the first question is, what is one thing, what is the one thing that we desire? That we even ask God for. You know, last night we had a great time with the young adults, Cindy and I and, and Derek and Pam and Sam and Sinky, and we sat here as old turkeys and answered questions for them. And the one, number one thing that was expressed by us to them is, don't make having that spouse the idol. The one thing, everything, oh Lord, just give me that person, you know. Yes, we pray for them. Yes, we desire it. Yes, it's an important thing. But the greatest killjoy, and I'll tell you why, is because if the one thing you desire is that spouse, that relationship, I know that God says that he's a jealous God. And he says, I can't share the throne. So if this person's going to be on your throne, then do you think I'm really going to answer that prayer? Because it's just going to cause you to stumble and fall. And so... One thing that he asked, to see the beauty of the Lord. And we have so many things that seem to step in front of what we desire. I think that that is not on the top of our list because we have yet to understand what David did and see what David said. Because if we would understand, man, one thing, I just want to see your beauty. 
That sounds like somebody when it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Someone who has actually been into the presence of the Holy of Holies. And I'm not talking about the building itself. I'm talking about if you have ever been there in his presence without all distractions and had that encounter with God that you are speechless, wordless. All about you is just knowing that you are there and you are loved. And that is the most beautiful thing you could ever encounter is true and unconditional love with God. Folks, bam! It's there. That's the one thing I ask. And you see, we don't even ask because we haven't even yet been there because we didn't even know to ask for it. You have not because you ask not. See, this gives me another insight to what we studied last week about David when he says that he was a man after God's heart. He's a man after God's heart, his own heart. And so we know, we learned that God distinguishes us by the desires of our heart. And so what is the desire of your heart? Maybe today it can at least be honest and you would say, Lord, I want to know you more. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but I want to be hungry to be more hungry. I want to desire to have more desire to be more in your presence, to understand what that is. I understand I don't even know what I'm talking about, but it seems like that guy up there is pretty excited. And I want that. I tell you, that's what did it for me when I would see people that I loved and respected, one being Pastor Chuck, and he would just talk about his times alone with the Lord, and it was just like, yeah, I want to be there. And so that made me pursue what it means to be still in his presence. And God knows the desire of your heart. So he says, not only that this is the thing that I desire, this is the one thing is that I would to see your beauty, but then it says this, that I shall seek. That I shall seek. And what did I share last week? What we do is what we believe. And so when someone just says, well, I'd love to have a closer relationship with God, I would like to have this. Do you? Because it says seeking. This is in the present active tense. This is something that is on my search list. Kind of like when you're hungry and you're looking for a restaurant. You're seeking it. And you're seeking to find. Now think about this. This is what I will do is seek. And I want you to jot this down. I don't know if I put this praise up or not. But godly desires must lead to godly action for there to be any legitimacy to them. We can't just sit here and go, yeah, I would love to have a closer walk. I would love to. No, no. Godly desires must lead to godly action for there to be any legitimacy to it. Other than that, then it's just a, a like. It would be nice if. Because I find that we human beings do a pretty good job at getting what we want. If I want milk, I go into the kitchen and grab a glass and get some milk. Am I making any sense here? Yes. So I hope what I'm trying to do here in this message this week for us to see what, what was working internally with David and how this affected him in so many other ways. And so it's not only, hey, I want to see your beauty, but I am going to do something about it. I will seek. But then it blows my mind as it says, and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, I don't believe he was saying, I just want to sit in this tent the whole time. However, obviously when he got there, it was something that was so amazing that he would desire all the more. Man, this is what it's about. About. This is what I'm going to be. Not in the, all the, the magistry, the pageantry that you have as a king, but being in God's house and God's place. But I don't think he's talking about just that limited spot where it is. You know, family, there have been a lot of things, written poems, and a lot of songs about the longing for home. Come on, Hawaiians. <laughs> I mean, C and K, right? Home, I got to be there. Beamers, what was that? Each night, Honolulu. I mean, all this time, people all over the place longing for Hawaii. No, no, no. David's man. Heaven. Uh. Oh, don't be so heavenly minded because then you'll be no earthly good. Humbug. If you're going to be any good, you got to get heavenly minded. 
because I don't need what this world is offering. I don't need its critique, its affirmations, whatever. If I understand, well, we're going to see David understanding here. So important. And so what do we see here in verse 4? We see a home-born child of God longing to be home with Father. Of all the things he has in front of man, I just, oh, just to be in your presence. Just longing for home. And then again, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Well, according to the Bible, it's a pretty amazing stoke for both earthly and heavenly worshipers. How many times do we see through the Bible? Here's just one, Revelation 19. And after these things, I heard like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Folks, doesn't sound like they're bored. Come on, amen? Okay, I'm going to jump into an illustration that I have absolutely no time for, but I got to give it to you. <laughs> because there's several of you that have not heard this, because <clears throat> I know it was a while ago. But when I was a young guy teaching the junior hires, so I myself am 18, 19 years old, and I'm teaching through, and we get to when it says, and the heavenly host was saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And they will be singing it and saying it for eternity. And I'm like, that'll be fun for about four minutes. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty. Because I don't know about you, but my ADD, <laughs> when even the worship leaders are going to the same line for like 10 times in a row, I secretly want to crawl up on stage We get it. He is able, 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 he is able. Duh! Am I the only one? Okay. Sometimes I'm like, did the worship leader forget how to, you know, stop the train or they just missed the loop so they just kept looping? I don't know. But that's not how it is in heaven. See what happens when we finally behold his beauty? Look at me. We are finally, because the Bible says we can't look at him because of the sin in our own lives. So we can't gaze. We look through it dimly, it says, like a glass dimly. But then, Paul says, then we will see him. And what happens is that the presence of the Lord will be there. And we, the worshipers, come out and we will see God. And we're going to go, holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty. And then he's just going to turn just a little bit. And we're just going to see more than we saw before. And it'll be, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then, and then he's just going to turn a little bit more. And we're going to be like, holy, holy, for eternity, people. Yeah. Our minds just blown. Like, ah. Uh, no floating on a cloud with a little harp, okay? No. It's absolute continual illumination that is worth enduring earth for hmm Spurgeon put it this way we must not enter the assemblies of the saints meaning coming to church that's his word there in order to see or be seen or merely to hear the minister we must repair the gatherings of the righteous, intent upon the gracious object of learning more of the loving Father, more of the glorified Jesus, more of the mysterious Spirit, in order that we may the more lovingly admire and more reverently adore our gracious God. What a word it is, the beauty of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Wow, wow. See, some of you today came to church. Other you, some of you came to worship. You're going to have a different experience. Verse 5. For, you might want to underline a circle, in the day of trouble. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. And he will lift me up on a rock. 
Now, I do not believe that this is to be taken literally about being physically in the tabernacle itself. I believe it is speaking very clearly figuratively because of what he has already stated about all the things about God and most importantly, being in his presence. In fact, you know, Bible students, the word tabernacle itself is not a thing that is describing a, a, a physical place or location. It literally, two different times, the tabernacle is, it, or I should say, it's one of two places that were called the tent of meeting. Notice in the New Testament how it says he tabernacles amongst us. So it means togetherness. It means in this meeting place. And so what he is saying is, is that, hey, even when the day of trouble comes, I know where I'll be found in your presence. Because I know that's where you are all the time. And so that is where I will be comforted. But for us New Testament Christians, it's even sweeter because it says Jesus is referred to as the rock. So he says, hey, I'm going to be in this place, but I will be with you. And he will lift me up on the rock. And the rock is Jesus. So again, my location changes automatically when I truly become a worshiper of recognizing that he is with me. God's got this and he is thoroughly large. And so I want to tell you this. Oh, what a strength and what a comfort this is for the believer. And let me finish. And I mean the believer. Do you understand what I'm trying to say there? Not just the person who prayed a prayer. When all of the news, hey, you're not going to be able to afford this. It's not going to happen. This has changed. Job is over. Whatever it is. Stage four. There is comfort to the believer the one who has believed all that he has said before. The one who has believed that he is with you always, will never leave you nor forsake you. The one who believes that you have been made precious in his sight. And he paid that price with his glorious blood. And you are holy to him. Blameless to him. The one who believes that, then there truly is comfort regardless of the news. We hear the news. We respond to the news, but then we go to where God is and give it back. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, I'll show you. He says, and now. <laughs> so all the day of trouble, that I'm in the tabernacle. But he goes, and now, because I do this, my head will be lifted up above my enemies. Where are they? Okay, that, that's important for later. And I will offer in his tent. So what does that mean? I'm going to church. I'm going to the place. I'm nothing stopping me. From making my glorious treasure of going to God's house, to worship in God's house. There's something awesome about making that, that step, that effort, that act of service and worship. He says, and I'm going to go right there. I'm going to continue like Daniel, worshiping as I have, with shouts of joy. I will sing, and I love this, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I can see him writing and going, I'm going to sing. Oh yeah, I'm going to sing. <laughs> I'm going to sing, yes, I'm going to sing praises to the Lord. And in my head, I hear, can't stop it. Can't stop it. Duh, no, no, no. I just can't stop praising the Lord. And this is so amazing. He says, this is what I want to do. But what is so often missed when people read verse six is this. David here is expressing, see if I'm wrong, he is expressing total joy and the desire to praise and worship God, notice, in the midst of his threats and dangers. It says my enemies are around me, right? I had you acknowledge that. Well, this kind of seems foreign to us when we tend to need to see God do things our way before we can lift our hands and give praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Hmm. David brings the request, and this gives thanks and praise and is filled with joy, and yet his enemies are still all around them, breathing their threats of destruction. But those circumstances don't affect his, because he believes. Amen? I love that. Ask ourselves, Lord, am I, am I a person who has to wait to see what I think it ought to be before I will give thanks and praise? Or will I worship no matter what? How about Job? Though he slay me, I will, I will praise him. Hmm. I think that's a unique approach to COVID. 
to everything else. Amen? Amen. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. See, David now, he affirms that his Lord, that's Yahweh there, that Yahweh will hear him. Why? Because he's in his presence. It's pretty simple. If I'm in the presence, then with you and you're with me, then you are going to hear. And so he's like, Lord, I know. But you see, what often throws people in this verse is the word cry. Because the way we use the word cry, it signifies something that is sad or some kind of desperation. But that's not. The word kara in Hebrew, it literally means to summon. As a king, he would summon, mean, so it would be a decree, a cry, or to proclaim, to say something. And so here we see what's going on when David says this. It says very clearly, hear me, O Lord, when I cry, when I decree, when I make this proclamation and be gracious and answer it. What am I saying he's doing? Well, hey, David was a soldier and he himself was trained with weapons and he knew how to handle his weapons. And what he found was that he was quite at home with the weapon of prayer. How long does it take before we go for that one? Is it even in the top five? The weapon of prayer. And David says, man, I'm just going to cry out to God. I'm going to decree. I'm going to proclaim it. But here is, ooh, verse eight. This is such a telltale. He says this, when you said, David's now saying to God, he goes, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I shall seek. Hey, seek my face. Your face is what I will seek. Now, I want you to hear something here. John Corson puts it this way so succinctly. I just wanted you to read it with me. He says this. Here we see a real secret of David's life. That is, when the Lord said, seek my face, David didn't say, I'll get right to it, Lord, next Thursday. No, when the Spirit said, seek my face, David immediately said, your face, Lord, I will seek. Hmm. Something every surfer knows, that waves have a window of opportunity. They come and they go. In surfing more than any other sport, I believe, we have to deal with this. If you snooze, you, you lose. And so, because of today's modernity, we have all these machines. And so, when all of a sudden it looks like a swell is coming, all of our phones get lit up. Hey, check it out. Here's a swell. Here's a swell. And all these things come in. So, we are saying, wow, it's going to be five to seven. And you can begin to plan your week because here's the swell. Because they know that there's this small window of opportunity. And the fact is, is that with the sport of surfing, which I think is so unique than any others, many have gone to great lengths in order to be able to maximize those experiences of those windows of opportunity. Guys that I know that are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who have been window cleaners their whole life. So they could drop at a moment's notice and get there when the swell is. Guys who have made a career out of being a waiter because they work in the evening so that in the morning and the day they can be out in the water and surf. They have done so many sacrifices and made intentional actions so that they could maximize those experiences of the window of opportunity. Is anyone getting where I'm trying to go with this? The choices that they have made to maximize that encounter. Well, folks, in John chapter 3, in verse 8, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit being like a wind. And he says that no one knows when it comes or where it goes. And so may I suggest to us that when the Lord whispers in your ear and says, hey, come spend some time with me in prayer. Humble yourself before me. Hey, come and worship and share your heart with me. Let's go for a walk and talk things over. May I say, it's best you do so immediately. For that window of opportunity with the Lord, you never know. The Spirit comes, the Spirit goes. And I think we, I think we need to grasp when that opportunity is there, when God is calling. And you know, maybe, 
maybe I have more of a emphatic sense about this because of what I do. I got news today of a 30 year old boy. When I say boy, is because when I first knew Kekoa, he was two. So I've known him since he was two years old. And it was Kekoa, it's the one who had that crash on the moped last Friday, and they finally took him off the life support system. I knew him from Molokai. Married, four kids, two of them twins, gone. And talking to his mom today on the phone, listening and comforting, those last words said, those last memories of things. No one knows that that's going to be that last. No one knows the day and the hour. And so if God says, hey, let's take a moment next Thursday. No. David is saying here, when you said, seek my face, mm, your face, I saw it. And that is the beauty, the power of walking in such a relationship. Listen, if we are to have the Lord hear our voice, we must be careful to respond to his voice. And when he says, let's talk, I encourage you, get up. Now, look at me for a second. For some reason, most of us know there seems to be some kind of magical thing, whatever it is, in God's holy divine economy about 3.30 a.m. Oh, there's so much elbowing going on right now. 3.30. Anytime between 3 and 3.30. And you know what I found is that that's when God has to sometimes say, you know, Wax, you've just been going all over the place and this is what I needed to actually have you still and get your attention. And so, because sleep is a precious thing, I learned that if I gave him more attention during the day, the 3.30s happen less. <laughs> Just a thought. Hmm. And then, verse 9. He says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Now, this little section of these two verses is very confusing to those who read this, who do not understand it in the Hebrew. And when I say Hebrew, I'm not meaning just the language, but the context and the culture of what is being said. What do we know context plus content equals meaning and so here it is and I was surprised how many even commentaries were like now David has given his professions here but now we see him himself questioning and struggling no 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 that is not what the other places but that is not what is going on here David has clearly from the top emphasized God's steadfast faithfulness to him amen whom shall I dread whom shall I fear but that never meant that there would not be attacks and enemies in tough times. Verse 3, though a host encamp around me against me. So we see all throughout this that David is saying these things. That I understand that God is large and, but I also live in a world that is full of sin. And so our poet... David, using this poetic language, he is using these questions actually in the opposite. Symbolically as an affirmation statement. Basically saying, you do not hide. You do not turn. You do not abandon. How do I know that? Because he says, oh God of my salvation. So in that, you know, the do not, do not, he's bringing that before him as, as an actual, odd, as, an, as an act of praise, an act of worship as he brings it out. My point, David is casting his cares to the Lord because he knows that the Lord, what? Cares for him. He's bringing it straight to the Lord. These are not questions of uncertainty, like a normal do not, do not. That would be coming out of uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen, so please, he's not saying that. How do I know that? Well, verse 10 is pretty much a good giveaway right there, that he is speaking po po excuse me, poetically. Because family, there is no reference ever anywhere that David's father or mother forsook him. What David is saying is that if a parent could and no loving parent ever could forsake their child, the Lord never will. That should have been an amen. amen. Last week, verse 21, Psalm 21, I will not be 
shaken. So God is saying, even the closest relationships around me may fail, but you will never fail me. And then he says this, but the Lord will take me up. When I read that, my mind immediately went to another New Testament illustration. Another New Testament idea, image. John 3, 14, there Jesus is describing as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, speaking of himself, be lifted up so that whoever believes, what? Will in him. Whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is telling us exactly what was going to happen on the cross. And in the same way that the serpent brought deliverance, what he did brought up deliverance. And so when he says, David says, I believe prophetically saying it, that the Lord will lift me up. Oh yeah, absolutely here. Jesus, you took me right up on that cross when you went there. Amen. You took me right up on that cross. All of my sin you bore, not your own. And so I guess that then begs the question for us to ask ourselves of this truly God who loves us no matter what, who gave all that is there for there's so much to be grateful and to have a peace in his presence. Then I guess we must ask, how much do you and I actually bank on? How much do you and I actually rely on scripture like verse or Lamentations 3.21? When he says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Okay, stop right there, eyes this way, please. He says, this I recall to my mind, so it gives me hope. See, there's a good thing about being in the word and in scripture and memorizing it because it can change your day. He says, all this is going on, but then in the writer of Lamentations, and you know, Lamentations is about a heavy heart. He says, all this is there, but I tell you why I have hope. I reflected, I remembered this. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have what? Hope, Hope in him. What did I say? What is the world is starving last week? It's starving from a malnutrition of hope. And two times in this little section, he talks about hope. How come he has such hope? Look at verse 11. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in the level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. Huh. You know what? I think David is saying, and I'm saying it with him, the longer I walk with you, Lord, the more I learn of you. And one of the things I learn is this. Faith is not a shelter against difficulties, but a belief in the face of contradiction. I've been saying that since I wrote it in my Bible at 19 years old. Faith is not a shelter against difficulties, but it's that belief in the face. I mean, I got a mountain and a mountain and the Egyptians on water. Everything, this looks like a contradiction when God said he will provide. But he did, and he does. That's what faith is. That is the bringer of hope. But he says, what's the problem? False witnesses have risen against me, and such breathe out violence. I guess they went on their Twitter. I thought it rather interesting that Spurgeon, in his commentary, talked about this false witnesses. And he says, slander is an old-fashioned weapon out of the armory of hell and is still in plentiful use. And I laughed and I said, oh, if you only knew what social media was. <laughs> hmm. And so now these last two verses and this Psalm closes and what a powerful closing. What an amazing transparency. So much so that it has been a blessing to countless through the ages. Verse 13, I would have what? I would have despaired unless 
I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. He is thoroughly expressing his belief that God is in fact large and I mean, thoroughly, he understands. He doesn't just rhyme it. He knows it. He believes it. And this is what he writes. And you know what is so sad? Is, is, is the NIV very poorly, poorly translates this verse and goes directly to, and as it says, I remain confident of this. No. What I believe we need to see is David himself, as he writes in Hebrew, saying, all of these things around me. I've been telling you about how good God is, but don't you think that means that everything has been smooth and easy for me, and I live in some kind of bubble that, oh, God's got this, God's got this, so nothing ever has an impact on my life. He just told us, man, I could have, would have almost gave up. If, if what? Unless I had, what's it say, church? Come on, help me out. Believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Family, being stirred up by anything frightening is as natural as breathing. But we need to know where to go with it. And here I have David, my Goliath killing warrior, expressing his emotions over and over through the Psalms. And here I think he's kind of saying, man, if I didn't believe in heaven, if I didn't have a perspective of eternity, I coulda, woulda, shoulda. But instead, I have hope. Because I do believe in you. And I will believe in your promises. What is hope? Do you remember that definition I told you years ago? Over and over, the definition of hope is the expectation of the coming good. That's the literal translation of the Hebrew word. The expectation, meaning it's already Garen Balbarans. It's the expectation of the coming good. But we don't use hope that way, do we? We use it as wish. I hope there's surf tomorrow. I hope that this is going to happen. I hope we're not going to... No, no, that's not the word hope. The word, it is an absolute, I have this consequence. It's called hope because it's an expectation, excitement about something that I know is there. Guaranteed. That's what it means. And here we have hope. Why? It is different than faith because faith and hope have different perspective. Hope, family, listen, hope looks to the future. My faith in him now gives me hope which looks towards the future, which means I am not affected by all these other consequences because my hope is in him, not in me. And it says, in the land of the living. I'm sure you recognize that where we live now is in the land of the dying. This isn't the land of the living. But there is a promise for those who have received God's word, will, and way. And this promise says that there will be a place with him where there is no death, no sorrow, no fear, nor pain. Amen. Anybody want to be there? Yeah. Hallelujah. Revelation 21. And so by faith, receive it, family. Believe it that he, God, is going to do good things, the best things in his time. One is churchianity. The other is Christianity. So with, in conclusion, I just want to ask you this. What? Who do you have faith in? As we see this psalm here, it is an amazing recollection for us to understand, yeah, exactly where is my faith and my hope? Where is it? Because Mark Batterson, in his book, All In, made a powerful challenge. As he said this, and I quote, you can have faith or you can have control, but you cannot have both. If you want God to do something off the chart, you have to take your hands off the controls. You can have faith or you can have control, but you cannot have both. Some of you I just expressed your angst. Why you've been upset, negative, whatever it may be. You can have faith. One thing have I asked, see your beauty, because the Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. So all I want is just more of you. I don't need more control. I don't need you to tell me what it's going to look like in the next week, next month. I don't need to have all of this sense of security that I think that I can somehow control. No, 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 no. 
It just comes down to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That changed everything. And so I end with this psalm, have you? Have you been crucified with Christ? Because that comfort comes to the believer that you are my light. I can only see because of you. And because I have salvation, what could anyone else do to me? The worst thing they could do is take my life and that only makes things better. Hmm. And so therefore, with all that knowledge, then there's one thing that I desire. And that is to behold your beauty, to be with you even deeper, a closer, intimate, more powerful relationship with you. Because I want to see you and I can't wait to dwell with you in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. That'll give you the pep, the pickup, the power, and the hope in this life. Worship him, for he loves us and he's done so much for us and wants so much for you. Is he your savior today? Savior, not just the Lord out there, but is he yours? Can you say the Lord is my light and my salvation? Lord is not even his name when we use the word Adonai, Yahweh, his name, but even Lord is a job description. Is he the one truly governing and leading the person whom you look to or are we still having a hand on the controls? Christian, understand today, maybe God is saying, step back, your worship will get better. But for today, if you have not fully made that commitment, whether you're with us or home watching us somewhere else or listening in a car on radio, whatever it is, all you have to do is surrender. That's it. God, I believe you are who you say you are. Only you can forgive me. Only you can guide me into everlasting life. You died on that cross because you love me and for my sin. And because you were lifted up for me, all I got to do is look up to you and my whole eternity and life now gets a whole lot better. Aloha, I'm Arielle and I'm the front office manager at One Love Ministries. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you are inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we really encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. And most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill out a form so we can stay connected. And one last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope you are blessed by our time together.